All right. Happy Friday, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have special guest Reverend Caleb Afuleke with us. He's an ordained minister of the excuse me, Evangelical Church Winning All. It's ECWA. He started pastoral ministry in 2002. Caleb is the part-time staff chaplain at the Aurora Medical Center, Mount Pleasant, and a part-time hospice chaplain with Event Health or Advent Health health. He did his clinical pastoral education internship at Advocate Lutheran General Hospital and his residency at Advocate Condell Medical Center. He's a board certified chaplain and Caleb holds a PhD in biblical literature, which is the Hebrew Bible, from Trinity International University in Deerfield, Illinois. He's got a M Divinity and MA in biblical languages from Gordon Cornwell Theological Seminary in Massachusetts. His research interest is biblical justice and Caleb and his wife Happiness recently celebrated their 19th marriage anniversary, and they're blessed with four children. Lovely to have you here, Caleb, and welcome. I'll give you the floor. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for the invitation and to the Friday chat talk uh, for allowing me to come. Um, as you can hear, I have accent. I, I am a Nigerian, actually. I came to the United States in 2010 with my family. <clears throat> um, today, I just wanted to have, um, let us think about something we often do not want to think about, something we want to wish away, but something we deal with every day in our profession. And um, so I titled it the random thoughts of a hospice chaplain on grief. Um, random thoughts of a hospice chaplain and grief. Disclaimer, I'm not an expert on grief. I just, um, maybe just um, present something to help us to maybe talk about uh, this, this thing. So in addition to being a hospital chaplain, I have been a hospice chaplain for close to two years now. And today is my last day with hospice. Um, so what a good time to talk about you know, some of the things I have learned from hospice. Um, so I see death and grief um, every day, but anticipatory, complicated, uh, um, almost on daily basis. And I think you too do, you do too. Um, I have had my own share of grief. Uh, I, perhaps you too um, have. So I'm actually interested in knowing how people feel with grief, especially the cultural elements. I will talk a little bit about this when I share my own experience um, from my country and then here of grief. Um, and I will invite you to, if possible, share some of your thoughts, um, maybe from your own background, um, what it looks like. Though I want to be random, um, I just want to use this uh, resource here to put my thoughts together um, defining what grief is. So this is all our, all our losses, all our griefs um, written by uh, Kenneth Mitchell and Herbert Anderson. So I read, I've, I've not read all the books, but I read a couple of pages and chapters. So I like the way they describe the, the uh, defined grief. And uh, they say grief is the normal so I try to highlight the things I want to focus on um, later on. Grief is a normal but bewildering cluster of ordinary human emotions arising in response to a significant loss, intensified and complicated by the relationship to the person or object lost. So, um, so I want to you know, focus on different parts of the definition one is normal. Um, even in my work as a chaplain, when I encounter grieving families, what we try to do is to normalize their grief, let them know that what they are going through is not uncommon to humans. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a part of human emotion to go through um, little grief, to accept it, to not dodge it, to not be ashamed of your tears, um, or however you express your grief. Um, because we believe that it's important to express it rather than bottle it in. So 
is a normal, they say it's normal to humans. And the other one they said is a cluster of ordinary human emotions. So they, they listed some of those human emotions like guilt, shame, loneliness, anxiety, anger, terror, bewilderment, emptiness, profound sadness, despair, and helplessness. The list can go on and on. So they say it's a clustering. So in their own definition, so it's a clustering of some or all of these emotions that amounts to grief. So that's how they say it. Um, but I also, I'm also aware there are other people who say differently. For instance, David Schweizer um, views anxiety as a major symptom of grief to which other all behavioral responses derive from. So uh, these people, they, they isolate anxiety first and then anxiety gives back to all of the, all the other emotions like we say they are whether guilt, shame, anger, loneliness and all the rest of them. So um, I don't know, I'm not here to say this is better, that it's better, but I'm just trying to use this one as a way of organizing my thoughts through it all. And maybe um, if you had your own experience, you can decide what, 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 what you feel. Is it a cluster of emotions or you, you felt anxiety? I feel, I know personally um, in my work, when I begin to feel anxious sometimes, um, I, I can think back and feel maybe things I've been seeing um, in the emergency room when I work in a trauma level, a level one trauma center, you know, see all kinds of things. So or what I encounter in my day-to-day um, -day job as a hospice chaplain and hospital, you know, hospital chaplain. So this is it, I'm a part-time hospital chaplain. And to today, I'm a part-time um, hospice chaplain, until today. So, Sometimes some of those things, uh, what I see sometimes, you know, can, you know, cause some kind of uh, response in me, um, and I begin to, you know, imagine, you know, what is happening and look back um, at what I'm feeling. So cluster of emotions first, then they say intensified and complicated by relationships. So. Um, they said that grief is a sign of involvement and affection or the cost of commitment. So whether it's friendships, marriage, family, colleagues, neighbors, jobs, and other material stuff that we have some kind of attachment to, when we lose those things, uh, we, feel, we feel grief. Um, um, so that's, they're trying to let us understand that. I also think as healthcare workers, um, serving, trying to serve with compassion, we sometimes develop affection, you know, with people we care for, especially like in hospice and palliative care. Sometimes you can have, you know, lingering, you know, a situation where you have patients for a long time. I had a patient um, uh, for close to a year, and you know, we develop some kind of affection for each other. We, you know, I see her on Wednesdays, and she was looking forward to me coming every Wednesday. I was looking forward to going to see her, see her every Wednesday and, you know, she passed eventually, you know, I felt grief um, when I, you know, when I had about her passing and there are so many other patients I have had that, um, you know, um, passed, you know, and, you know, I felt some, some grief, you know, because of the commitment and the relationship I have developed with them before they are passing. Okay. So the person or object lost. So grief is not just limited to uh, um, to loss loss of persons, you know. And I think that's that's one of the things this book wanted us to know about. So it's not only sometimes we tend to give significance to the loss to any loss resulting from death, uh, but um, this book wanted us to pay attention to other types of losses that we experience. And um, they identified, you know, six types of losses. Um, I'm not gonna go into details, I'm just listing them. Material loss, relationship loss, inter-psychic loss, functional loss, role loss, systemic loss. And so, and one can experience um, a mixture of this uh, at the same time. So um, for me, from my work as a hospice patient and also a chaplain, um, 
some of the losses I have noticed as I talk with people in the hospital, uh, can with in the in the hospice situation, you know, there's this loss of independence, loss of control. You know, you're not able to do things, or if you like, some some people who have been used to you know taking care of family, you know, taking care of family affairs, they, they lose that control, loss of their home when they are being sent to a, a care facility, loss of the ability to enjoy things that they value, like vacations, travel garden etc um, loss of self image or loss of sight loss of hearing loss of you know even body part recently i was with somebody they just amputated one of her toes and she was feeling grief she's she's missing that and saying she has to learn how to you know to accept this and and be able to move on and live without it so there are other kinds of losses uh, that we deal with every day that are not necessarily deaf, and they we need to also be able to acknowledge those as loss and pay attention to them, um, you know, take care of um, them. So now getting to the part that we deal with the question you asked earlier, um, um, Rachel. So how the dealing with grief? How do we deal with grief? Um, so. First is that we need to acknowledge grief. We need to acknowledge grief. So be honest to yourself. Get in touch with your feeling. You know, avoidance or emotional distancing can boomerang. It can, you know, you push it for some time, it can come back to you in a more powerful way. So it's important that we, we acknowledge this process of grieving. So the next thing is to ride the wave uh, when it comes. Do not resist it, you know, or the techniques like the teachers, when you go to the beach and then or suddenly waves come, don't resist, you, you swim, uh, is it horizontal instead of parallel, uh, so that it doesn't, you know, suck you in. And grief is like waves, you know, sometimes it's calm, but at times, you know, the sea is calm, other times it rises, and things like, you know, photos, holidays, occasions, you know, we steer up the waves. You know, recently I was talking with someone uh, just last week and she was telling me she lost her dad since 2018 and but she's still feeling grief. And uh, as holiday is coming, she says it's even more difficult for her uh, to feel, you know, as ho holiday is coming. So those things remind us. To, so what do you do? Not just avoid it, not just to, not to suppress it, but when the waves rise, you know, find a way of riding the waves, but don't let it suck you back in. And, and stay there. So I feel this is my thoughts. It's not any scientifically proven anything. Uh, like grief is like almost like addiction. Once you experience it, you are always in recovery and chances of relapse is high because something can trigger it and remind you, you know, of um, that grief. So next thing is to seek support. Um, you know, grieving alone should not be, you know, grief can be, I say, profoundly private thing, but don't, privacy should not be an isolation, isolation uh, from meaningful community that can support you um, during, um, during the process of grief. So community involvement may differ for different people for different reasons. So I wanna share a little bit about my experience, you know, as an African and as, um, now living in the US, uh, it, from where I come from, my cultural background, grief is a community thing. If I said that in the community, everybody shows up. It doesn't matter what faith or what background. Once they hear it, no invitation is needed. People show up. You're never alone. People support you through it. Um, you know, when you grieve. So when I came here to the United States, I go to church and I hear announcements like, you know, somebody lost their baby or they lost somebody and they say, you know, they, they we have requested that you respect their privacy. I didn't understand it. It doesn't make sense to me, you know, coming, being an outsider, you know, hearing those kind of stuff. Then 2012, when I lost my brother-in-law, who is also like a son to me, you know, and people gave us our privacy, you know, people didn't show up who were alone. And it was very, very bewildering to us. Me and my family were young and new here. And uh, even our pastors, they called to take permission to show up. 
We don't do that in Nigeria. People just show up. If I, if as a pastor, if I hear that my member has lost somebody, I just drive that straight there to go and visit. So people brought flowers, cards. They were helpful, but we were alone because that's not how we know to grieve. And why I'm bringing this up also as healthcare workers, people helping people, it's important to ask questions, but to know how do people grieve, you know, different from me so that I, you can be helpful to them, not responding in your own way. Because for us, people responded in, your, in their own way. They did the best they can by giving us kind of flowers, but we needed presence. There was no presence. And also that should also help us like even with COVID, Visitors restrictions, you know, how to different, how does it affect different people, people from different cultural backgrounds? For instance, working in the hospital, I realized that if somebody comes to the, let's say, emergency room and this person is from, is a, from Latinx background, you're going to have a lot of people show up. The room is going to fill up. If it is in the night, I know I'm going to have a long night with people who will be coming and going. The same thing close me from the black community too, but not so much from you know, the Caucasian community. For that's my own observation. So even at that, we see that grief does not affect everybody the same. You know, and knowing some of these things can help us to be you know, conscious about how we at least make ourselves available, finding out how we can help people during their time of grief and be of the best support we can be for them. Um, coming to healthcare workers, like going back to your question is, you know, accumulated grief, you know, from loss of those who care for can lead to compassion fatigue. Uh, in your primary community, in this case, you know, is your colleague, the briefing, you know, you know, talking to somebody who is going through the same thing or who have been through the same thing is very, very helpful to in fostering um, resilience among healthcare workers. So don't just take it in. Also for me personally, you know, go walk in the park, you know, you know, um, I'm a I'm a person of faith, so I pray also. Um, when I feel anxious, I talk to my wife. So um, that this is how I'm feeling, and she, some, you know, talking alone with her helps me, you know, not to bottle it in, and uh, you know, just you know, lead it, it can spiral from there to uh, to fear and other kinds of things. So yeah. Um, I know uh, time is fast spent, but these are some of the things I wanted to share. So as a part of the discussion, if we still have time, I believe, I hope so. I want to know um, maybe how do you deal with grief? How do you, how do people grieve in your culture or, uh, or your culture or your cultural background? Any other thoughts or questions? So thank you for your time. Thanks for all that, Caleb. We appreciate that. Marty's going to stand up, so go ahead, Marty. Thank you. Um, so the, the palliative care mentors and providers uh, I've really admired most. Um, I've found a way to address these hard topics like grief, but I've noticed that there it's not just that they address it, it's how they address it and the tone of how they address it. And almost as if there is a, a real skill set to keeping and preserving hope and uplifting people. Because what, what I worry about, and I think what I made a mistake in when I was a fellow was bringing it up in a very somber tone and bringing people into sort of this dark place and then just leaving them there. Um, and we don't want to just leave them there. We want to try to help lift people up and and make them stronger and acknowledge it but acknowledge it in a certain way what what are your thoughts on how you talk to people about these things but also help to uplift them at the same time well, yeah um yeah i think um <laughs> one thing people told me have sell to me is uh one is that my voice, I don't know, this is my personality people have heard from me is that my voice is calming to them. When I talk to them, when I sit with them, they, you, know, you know, being able to show compassion, you know, uh, during that time. And uh, if, yes, maybe start with the somber tone, 
you're not going to go there and say, hey, hey, you know, try to share everybody up as if uh, it's nothing. But again, um, even being there and being calm and being quiet and not even saying a lot, sometimes people appreciate the presence. Then if you linger a little bit, you hear that people begin to tell story of the person that they lost. They begin to you know, you know, remember, share memories. And that becomes something you can latch on, you know, because memories, uh, for me, are the, the most valuable resource that anybody can leave, whether to your colleagues, whether to your family. I mean, you can leave millions of dollars that if there's no good memory for them to cherish, those, all of those things will be rubbish. So for me, I, I try to, you know, lead them towards, you know, that aspect of sharing memories. And you can see them begin to laugh, even talk about it, even if it's just like some horrible thing that has happened. But when they begin to share memories, they begin, you see, they begin to laugh, you know, among themselves. So for me, that's one of the routes that I, I, I try to go um in leading them out there and then again finding out uh if they have any hope faith faith matters in time like this um so if they have any form of belief especially when it has to do with afterlife um so that's another thing you know when people talk about it that hope of you know oh it's not the end we're going to meet again it doesn't matter from your own perspective whether it is real or not but it matters to them. So um, it becomes something to, to use also to, um, mm. uh, according to their belief, not fostering your belief on them to help them to begin to organize, you know, think through uh, what they are going through, uh, we hope. Gotcha. So really it's honing in on meaning making, mm -hmm. Memories, other, there are many ways that you can help lead people out of these things. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. We have a question in the chat. Uh, Lavera says, What approaches have you found successful with grieving children? So I did a little bit of work with children because I worked on an inpatient unit that served pediatrics and adults. And we had a brief training uh, with our social worker who was also a child life specialist mm -hmm. and her advice, because of course you can't train everybody to be experts in a brief time, but her advice to us was reach out to her to gain the resources. But when she wasn't available to just provide presence, like you said, the power of presence is so important. Uh, and to really listen to those children and to focus on hope, if you could, you know, find that hope with them and not to answer their questions, to let the children find their own answers. Um, but I'm certainly not an expert. Uh, I only worked on that unit for a year, so I, I can't claim expertise. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what yeah. I learned about children. Yeah, that's helpful. That's helpful. So we have another uh, comment in the chat. It's not a question. Um, uh, just hearing about the speaker speak about grief makes me feel better, and I'm not fully sure why grief seems a private space for this particular writer. They do have a fear. They hope that they will never experience the grief or suffering or death of their wife or their children, which that that's that I think is something we all think about, right? We don't want to watch our loved ones go through something mm -hmm. that's so difficult, and then I think our anticipatory grief for thinking about that loss can be mm -hmm. very difficult in the moment. Um, yeah. yeah, and but it's a reality of life. Um, yeah. And that's why they say the price of commitment. When we commit to something, um, we don't want to see it happen. But the reality is that today there are people who are grieving the loss of a child, loss of a uh, um, husband, a wife, a relative, our colleagues. Mm -hmm. So um, we we pray, you know, I pray every day, pray away all of that. But again, you know that you need to kind of prepare yourself. Um, it will definitely, if we live long enough, yeah. if we live long enough, we will experience it. We don't, it's not a, it's not a comfortable truth. Right. And it's the life cycle. Unfortunately, I think we have to remember that it's part of the life cycle uh you know that we cannot escape from quite mm -hmm. frankly so uh, marty has a second question so i'll defer to you marty maybe this will be our, our last one for the day um 
when I was listening to you speak, Caleb, it reminded me of reading a book by Joan Halifax. And she talked in there about being in the darkness with people and how it's almost impossible to not absorb a little bit of that darkness when you're sitting mm -hmm. there with them, which mm -hmm. reminds me sort of a grief. When you're there with them, thinking about it, talking about it, it's hard for us not to think about it ourselves, absorb some of it, maybe cry with our patients. How do you as a chaplain help yourself to address these things, but also not absorb all this so you can continue to function? Oh yeah, you know, um, you know, it's it's hard sometimes to know how to strike a balance so that you're not detached because we want to start with compassion, and that's being compassionate means being in that darkness, you know, with them, you know. Um, but again, not trying to do it in a way, you know, not just be all in and not be all, you know, not be all out, like detached from what is happening. Um, yeah, so I agree with that. We absorb, I, I absorb it. And sometimes when I'm going on the day from one thing to another, I might not think about it so much, how much I'm absorbing, absorbing this. But over time, I, I might begin to have some feelings. And when I begin to have those feelings, I don't know if, if you have ever had a patient or something happened to a patient and then you're going home and you begin to think, what if, if it's me, you know, I. I have, maybe I started having some feelings. In fact, there was a time I ran to emergency room uh, because I was having a feeling around my chest and I've been ignoring it. And that morning I was in the emergency room and uh, somebody came in and they, they, he died of uh, he died of heart attack or something. And um, they said, and they were asking him, have you been feeling anything? Has he complained of any, any, any pain, chest pain, whatever, you know? I went home. <laughs> I told my wife, I'm going to emergency room. <laughs> you know, I'm feeling, you know, because I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to be that. You know, I don't want to. That's how it's coming, it's coming at me. I went to emergency room, they checked me, did everything, and they say, there's nothing wrong with you. So I went home and then paid the bill. You know, so some of those, some of some of that's how some of those things come. But being able to, like I said earlier, be in touch with my feeling when I begin to have those feelings um, that are coming out of nowhere that I cannot really put my fingers on. Everything is well with my family. You know, I'm not worried about paying bills, food, and all of that. And then I am having all these, you know, trepidations. Uh, you know, so that that for me that's a sign, and I, I need to, you know, either to talk to somebody, uh, go out and walk, go to the gym, work out or something, and maybe begin to you know, refocus um, a little bit. So that's how I, I, I try to help myself. Really good input. So we do have one more comment. Um, Steve mentions that he really appreciates the advice about just being present and allowing room to reminisce. Uh, he notices how laughter can sometimes come from these encounters. So I think you've given us a lot of things to think about, Caleb. Uh, and also maybe we need to remember to take care of our own grief and mm -hmm. be compassionate. I think you said be compassionate with ourselves and kind with ourselves. So that's a good reminder that we should take care of ourselves as well as our patients and the lives. So Yeah, and please be aware of the cultural implications or cultural dimensions of grief. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time, Caleb. And thank you to everyone who joined us this morning. We hope you have a wonderful Friday. Thank you. Bye-bye.